When I, when I was asked to come here, I was very happy. When I was asked to talk about failure, I thought this is quite difficult. Particularly embracing failure, um, cuddling it, loving it. I, I find that difficult. To me, failure is something to be avoided. I know it's part of what we do. Um, so I was uncertain what to say. And I um, look back at what I had thought and what I had written in the past and wondered if there's anything there that would help me to come up with something that would be interesting to you today. I came across a phrase that I had some time ago, which was um, that if you, if you don't fail, you're just not really trying, which I think is my attitude. In other words, the failure is built in to the thinking process, the creative process, the innovative process, um, into, into the human process. And then I thought, let's, let's look around for other examples that might illuminate that. And I came across two that both took place in my life at the same time, um, both in China, coincidentally, because that's where I spend a lot of my time. One was a book that I wrote with a young Chinese girl she was 12 when I met her. We were introduced by her father. She had already written three books. Her father said, looking at her, looking at me, why don't we write a book together? And we sort of looked at each other and we thought, don't adults say the funniest things? But we did, mainly under Zhao Li's persuasion, write a book together. And we aimed it at her contemporaries. She was then 14. She was a bright kid in a Chinese school. And she felt the school wasn't helping her. It was too didactic. It was too instructional. It wasn't helping her to develop her own ideas. So we aimed it at that group of young Chinese teenagers. Um, we wrote it together, although I have to say she wrote, she invented the characters, she wrote the plot, she wrote the dialogue. But we argued every line together. And it taught me a lot about how someone like that operates in a system where the system itself is failing. And that meant the individual was failing. And at the same time I was doing that, I think something that coincidentally I was asked to advise on the future of the Chinese school curriculum. And I came up with some ideas that I pitched up to the Minister of Education in China. And I want to say what those are. The first is that everybody is born creative. That it's actually not a special faculty or an unusual faculty, but it's, it's actually the mark of an ordinary human being. In fact, if, if they don't have the imagination, if they don't have the ability to respond to sense state, external sense data, if they don't adapt to that external state data, if they don't compare the reality of what's out there with their imaginings and their memory of the past, then they are not judged as a normal healthy child. And we now know that peak creativity, a bit like peak oil, happens in the ages of four and five. Up to that moment, we are enjoying that creativity, that development of our imaginations, our fantasies, to make life more comfortable, more physically more comfortable for us, and to make it more satisfying, more interesting for us. I call that the universality principle. The second principle is, is freedom. That freedom, that creativity needs freedom to be expressed. And it, it needs um, mainly external freedoms so we can share our ideas, follow ideas, reject ideas, reject bits of ideas, match ideas, put ideas together. There's a great ad years ago, I think a General Electric ad, which said every new idea is just two old ideas meeting for the first time, which I think is actually sums up how we have 
new ideas. So we need freedom. We need freedom to follow ideas that we want to follow. And we need markets. We need, to, we need markets where we can put ideas into the market as products and services with a price tag so people can know about them and have the freedom to transact to buy and to sell. Now, if I'm, if I'm halfway right about this, everybody is born creative. We need freedom to express our creativity, but in many countries, particularly this one, we have a lot of freedom. And we need markets. That's, that's an awful lot of creative people. That's an awful lot of people following their own ideas, having the freedom to follow their own ideas, having the freedom to put their ideas into the marketplace. That's an awful lot of people. And so I'm, I'm, I'm thinking what happens if you have a society as we have in Europe, we have in America, we are moving towards in China, where there is, where, where Creativity has become a sort of mass movement. It's, it's no longer something that only a few people do. A few special people. Um, which used to be the case, whether they were called artists or scientists. But it's now something that everybody wants to do, is increasingly able to do. And because we live in a world which is getting both more creative and more innovative, but also more difficult, more problematic in terms of poverty, energy, water, resources, waste, an awful lot of problems, an awful lot of creativity, and an awful lot of failure. Because I think, as we've heard this morning, you can't really be creative, you can't be innovative, in any meaningful way without making mistakes, getting it wrong. Um, I, I, I sometimes call the creative economy an economy of failure. Um, it's certainly, it, it's impossible to quantify, but I think there's more failure in the new economy dependent upon creativity and innovation than there is in, in extractive industries, in mining, in agriculture, in what I call repetitive manufacturing. There are more decisions made, more searches for what's interesting, more searches for what's new, what's appropriate, more desire to change, more desire to change not only one's own life, but the surroundings, the organisation. And as we've heard this morning, endemic in that is a lot of failure. Um, and one result of that is that the, the people who are having ideas, which is a competitive business, very competitive. It's difficult, it's lonely, it's difficult, and it's competitive. There's a very strong correlation between the people who are good at it and those who have been to college and university, um, come from stable homes, go to college and, and university. Very strong correlation. Um, one result of that is that the underclass, the people who don't have those benefits, don't have that education is increasing in my country, increasing, I think, in every European country, certainly increasing in Russia. I don't know the situation in America, but my guess is that there's a large number of people who do not get their foot on the, on the first rung of the ladder where they feel they can express their own creativity and contribute to that effort. I think that the numbers of those people is increasing and it's a real problem. I said it was competitive and I, I'm, um, I think it's competitive in two ways. Um, one is that inside my brain there's a rather um, unfriendly person. I call him a judge. And he knows exactly what I'm thinking. And he keeps on saying, is this the best you can do? Come on, this is really boring. 
Come on, you, you could do better than this, can't you? Work a bit harder, take a breather, try harder. Come on, come on, it's always there. You could do better than this. And some people find that really hard to cope with because it's inside the brain. You can't shut him up. And there's another judge, which is outside. In fact, there are hundreds of judges, thousands of judges outside. My, my colleagues, um, my friends, people I work with, my, my, my agent, my, 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 my manufacturer, my, my distributor, my guy that does the work in the retailers, and of course the market, all the time saying, taking decisions in a nanosecond. Is this the best you can do? Well, that isn't very interesting. And, doing, and looking and buying or experiencing something else, talking to someone else. And those two judges are always present. And this is why creativity actually is really difficult and why we fail so often. How do you cope with that? Well, I came across, I, 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 was, I was developing these ideas of the judges about a week ago, and, and um, coincidentally, I remembered something that had happened to me when I was at school, when I was eight. And I was sent away to school, age eight, normal British behavior. Um, and actually, I was very happy. And I was sent away to a wonderful school, a long way away, actually, and it was about 150 miles away, a long way in my country. And um, I met people my age, I had a great time. And after a few weeks, my tutor, we had tutors from the beginning, my tutor came to me and said, Johnny, um, it's half term. So um, it's time for the half-term report. And we're going to write a report, and we're going to send it to your parents. And my heart sort of sank, because I had sort of been like enjoying myself, and I mean, the lessons were there, but they weren't a big part of what we were up to. And I didn't like the idea of anybody coming along and, and being rather, I wouldn't have used the word, but sort of bureaucratic and formal about it making judgments on me, um, about which I really had sort of no control and I didn't think it was really very important. And he gave me the report. I looked at it. And it was blank. And I, I said, he said, you write the report. I said, what? So I wrote my, my school report. He did. And I suppose I could have said, everything's wonderful and I'm doing brilliantly, and, uh, but obviously, actually, I discovered afterwards that I didn't do it, I discovered afterwards that nobody else did that. We all took it very seriously. We became grown up. Not for long, <laughs> about 10 minutes probably, but we became grown up. And you probably have used that phrase, this is very famous in England, I don't know if it's famous here, but you know, could do better. Johnny could do better. And so I said, the things that I'm enjoying, the things I'm not enjoying, the things that I'm doing, I think, okay at, the things I know that I'm not really okay at at all, and the things that I could do better. And that went off to my mother. And at the end of term, that was the half term course, at the end of term, my tutor comes to me again and said, Johnny, it's time for the um, end of term report. So I, I got very excited. And I, I said, right, OK, where is it? And he said, no, no, now it's, now it's our turn. <laughs> and they wrote the report. But that moment when someone, when my teacher, had the 
confidence, in, not the confidence in me, but the sort of attitude towards me, that they felt that I should make the judgment on where I had succeeded and where I had failed, without any fanfare or without saying how important this was in my development and blah, 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 just very discreetly saying, here's the report, um, I'll come by and pick it up in 10 minutes, a day. That was very influential in me and enabled me to take control of where I was successful and knowing sometimes that was earned, more often not earned, and where I was failing and that it was up to me to do something about it. What the nature of it was and how I could do something about it. Very important, I think. Thank you for listening.